Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, guys. We are looking at chapter 11, key issues two and three today. Um, and so we kind of changed the way we were doing things a little bit because these two key issues really go together well. And we're looking at why do industries face energy challenges and then why do industries face pollution challenges and so the two kind of go together here as we talk about uh, energy and alternative sources of energy and then the pollution aspect of all of it so let's go ahead guys and get into it how does energy affect industry? We talk about the idea of supply and demand, right? Supply is the quantity of something that producers have, and demand is the quantity that people actually wish to consume or buy. And so when we talk about developed countries, we are the countries around the world that consume the most energy. And most of the energy sources are found in developing countries. And so that leads to the supply and demand issue. Uh, fossil fuel uh, just is basically the idea of energy that it's an energy source like coal, natural gas, or petroleum, right? Something that takes thousands of years or millions of years even to uh, form into energy sources that we can tap or harness from the earth, right? So look at the energy supply worldwide and kind of see how things are broken down uh, versus uh, kind of the amount being used and where it's being used or the timelines for when it's being used. Uh, you can see, obviously, now we're seeing more hydro, po hydro uh, power, geothermal power, and so those are more renewable resources. Uh, but those non-renewable resources, uh, petroleum, natural gas, coal, wood, um, fall in there. Nuclear power is kind of a, a in between the two. It is something that we do need material to use, and we just need such little a bit of it that it is kind of considered a renewable energy. And then here's your demand. So again, you can see that the developed region or the developed parts of the world tend to use much more of the energy than the other parts of the world, right? And so you can see the United States, China definitely um, stand out on our map here. Um, and we can kind of look at the other countries too, um, the kind of darker, not darkest, but darker purple countries as well kind of stand out compared to the much of the rest of the world here. <clears throat> we look at uh, developing countries versus developed countries and the amount of energy again being used. Again, uh, this is the idea of uh, how much work actually goes into the amount of energy that you're getting. All right. And then we obviously go beyond 2021 here. So you can see kind of the projection that we're expected to see moving forward. Here's your amount of energy used, in this case, to make orange juice, right? So you can see quite a bit of it goes into agriculture, right? 37% of the energy used actually goes to the agricultural aspect of it between fertilizer and transportation. Then we get into the processing, and then after the fact, the disposal, the packaging, the distribution of it, quite a bit going into that as well. So how does the distribution of fossil fuels affect industry? Right, fossil fuels are resources that are ob obviously not uniformly distributed. Like we said, a lot of the fossil fuels we have today are in those developing parts of the world, developing regions, and it's the developed countries or developed regions that want to tap into that potential supply. And so we have three ways of looking at fossil fuels and, and how they are distributed. We have proven reserve, which are the supply of energy remaining in deposits that we have that have been discovered. We have the potential reserve, which is the supply that are in deposits that are undiscovered, but we think that they're there. And then we have the unconventional resource, which is not considered um, really until the price and the technology allow us to do it. So think of the example like hydraulic fracturing for, for oil um, or natural gas or, or even um, pulling the, uh, the resources out of the oil sands. Um, we can do it now, but we weren't able to do that just a few years back. All right. And so here's our fossil fuels, and you can see kind of the, the use of fossil fuels again around the globe. And there's a few countries that obviously stand out. The United States, uh, Russia seems to quite a bit. Canada um, is one of the higher ones. China um, is one of the higher ones through all these as well. Right? And then here's your proven reserves. These are the reserves, again, we know that they're there. We know that we can access them. And we're looking at the different ideas here uh, between the developed to developing nations. So a lot of the, again, a lot of it being used by the developed nations here in a lot of cases. What challenges has the U.S. faced with petroleum? So we know oil is obviously one of the main 
fossil fuels that is used. And we know that we face a lot of difficulty trying to meet the demand that we have for it. Specifically, um, the amount of demand that we have doesn't necessarily meet up with our domestic production. So we have to rely really heavily on other countries and importing the oil from those other countries as well. And so you can see kind of those countries that we tend to rely most heavily on um, today or closest to today in 2017. About half of our supply comes domestically. Um, and then we rely pretty heavily on Canada. Um, and then you can see all the uh, OPEC nations, so the oil uh, producing exporting countries there uh, around in kind of in the blue, a lot of them falling into the uh, the Middle East. You can see there's some in South America as well. And so here's our petroleum challenges. You can see, again, where our petroleum is coming from. A lot of it coming from Canada, some from Mexico, Venezuela, and then Saudi Arabia. Those are our main sources. And you can see all the other countries are sending theirs to different parts of the world too. The U.S., Europe, and China and India, Japan are kind of the top destinations for petroleum exporting countries around the globe. We use a lot more than most of the other parts of the world. We can kind of look at the future of fossil fuels. Um, oil prices are starting to reflect the demand that we see for it. Obviously, it's always been that way. And <clears throat> we see declining demand largely because we're starting to change some of the, the supplies of uh, oil and petroleum that are being used. And so you can kind of see where our uh, right around 2015, 2016, you can see the demand uh, dropped quite a bit. Um, and we're starting to see that spike back up a little bit now again. Um, but will we see changes in that when we start to see um, more renewable resources being used? Things like solar power and uh, geothermal and hydroelectric and things like that. May, we may see changes. And here's your possible future for some of those other fossil fuels. Again, leading us into about 2020 there, a little bit shy of that. But fuel prices obviously increased sharply in the 1970s. You can see it right there. Right. And then uh, we see again in the 2000s. And so are we going to see more use of alternative forms of energy in the future, which would, again, drop the price of these fossil fuels being used? We look at uh, this is an example or a picture here that shows the oil sands, uh, another unconventional way of actually um, finding more resources, finding the oil here. Uh, they can kind of take it right out of there. It's being widely used more because now we have the technology to extract the oil right out of these sands like this right here versus trying to drill down far enough to find the oil reserves. As you can see, not real great for the uh, environment, though. Right. A lot of a uh, lot of area being torn up to, to find the, the oil there. Um, we also look at hydraulic fracking as another option that has uh, become more and more possible here. Um, this requires enormous amounts of water to be basically shot into the shale deposits in the ground, and it cracks it all up. And when it does that, it, re it releases natural gas, and we're able to capture that and harness that natural gas then from there. Um, again, it's not very good for the environment either, right? And you are destroying, you know, a layer of, of the shale um, below the surface. So we look at our future possible um, fossil fuels throughout uh, uh, the United States here. We look at uh, natural gas specifically, and you can see all those places. The dark red are the areas that we see current production and the fact that we see, we know there's proven reserves there. And then we get into the orangish areas that are the potential reserves, areas that we could tap in the future. This is again, just for natural gas. And so this would be with the development of fracking technology. We can tap more area and find more natural gas if we need it. So how does nuclear energy play into all this? We've talked about the basic idea here uh, a little bit with coal and oil specifically and then the natural gas. Uh, nuclear energy is a little bit different and it has some challenges that come with it. All right. Uh, about 14 percent of the nuclear supplies, um, or excuse me, supply the nuclear, 14 uh, percent of the nu of nuclear power supplies the uh, world's electricity. All right. So 14 percent of the world's electricity comes from this. Two thirds of the nuclear power then comes from the developed regions of the world. It's extremely expensive um, to, to do this. And so when we look at Europe is the most dependent on nuclear power today. There's other parts of the world that use it as well. We know there's some here in the United States. There are some big concerns with this. Um, we know there's a potential for accidents. In fact, they've happened before. We have Three Mile Island in New York was a possible place where there could have been a nuclear accident. We know Chernobyl was the site of a nuclear accident in the Ukraine. So they are possible. Um, those accidents are possible to happen. We also need to be able to dispose of the nuclear waste. And that becomes an issue of where do we dispose of it? We can't just store it forever. What do we do with nuclear waste? Um, other issues, um, 
it, can it be weaponized? And the use of nuclear energy being weaponized would be a huge concern because we've obviously pulled back on the amount of nuclear weapons worldwide. Um, there is a limited reserve here. We know that it, there isn't an endless supply of, of the fuel or the resources you need, plutonium and uranium. And uh, also we look at the high cost of production and maintenance. Again, the reason why it's more developed parts of the world using this is because it costs a lot of money to do it. Again, it's a great form of energy, but it has a lot of downsides and a lot of drawbacks here. So here's your nuclear energy worldwide. Again, you can see Europe is kind of your leader there. South Korea falls in there as well. Um, but again, a lot of the parts of the world that we're seeing using it are, tend to be more developed parts of the world. Right? There you can see the uh, nuclear power plants in the United States and kind of where they sit. And then you've got the world uranium reserves. And so that you need uranium or plutonium to basically create the, uh, the nuclear energy and, and create that fission energy that we need. So you can see, again... Uh, a lot of it is in the developing region still. You can see a lot of uh, South America, a lot of Africa, um, where we have those uh, those issues. We also see Central Asia represented too. So what about the alternative resources? <clears throat> we get into some of the renewable energies, um, and this is a, there's multiple different renewable energies here, but this is a source that we know we could theoretically uh, use and it would be an unlimited supply. It would never be depleted by us using it. And so we have things like biomass, wind power, geothermal energy, and hydroelectric power, all of which we look at as uh, renewable energy or clean, uh, clean energy here. And so we talk about these alternative energy sources. Um, developing nations are starting to rely a lot more on specifically hydroelectric power. Uh, and you can see uh, specifically in South America, parts of Africa, um, South Asia, that they are using the, uh, the hydroelectric power. Uh, again, we tend to look at those areas as, as developing regions typically. China is a global leader in wind powder power. You can see how much wind power that they are using there. Um, and you can see some of the others there too. Developed regions, when we look at the United States, is the leader here in the developed regions. Um, but China obviously could be one of those countries that starts to emerge into becoming more developed. And they're leading the way with a lot of these different alternative energy sources. So you can see the potential wind power that we have um, in the United States, specifically across the Rocky Mountains and in the Great Plains there. There is, uh, if we were to be able to set up some wind farms in those areas, we'd have a, a very great potential to use wind power to uh, power quite a bit of, uh, of our energy or use uh, to utilize part, quite a bit of our energy sources here. Then we get into geothermal energy, and this requires uh, appropriate geological conditions. So the United States is a global leader, uh, but there are many small nations that can do this as well. Places like Iceland, Japan, New Zealand, they're able to harness the geometric, or excuse me, geothermal energy um, from their location, their their actual position um, on, the, on the earth here. And again, a lot of it comes back to volcanic activity. And so you can see the, the countries there, the developed countries that are leading the way, and some of the developing nations that are still leading the way here too. <clears throat> Finally, we get to uh, solar. Um, solar is probably the most uh, beneficial um, and, and the one that we see that will probably be used uh, the most here moving forward. Solar energy comes uh, can come as in two basic forms here. You have passive solar energy and you have active solar energy. And so passive solar energy, you're using the sun's energy for heating. So um, you might be like double or triple pan paned windows so that you're actually like kind of drawing the sun in, the sun heats up uh, the house or heats up wherever you're at. And then the active solar is actually converting the sun's energy to electricity. And so that's where you need things like solar panels or fo uh, photovoltaic uh, cells as well can be used for batteries. Um, so solar power can charge electric cars. It can be used to electrify remote villages. Uh, we can use it to do those things, but there are still some drawbacks to solar energy as well. You can see European countries are some of the leaders in solar energy, despite the fact that you know they're in located in northern latitudes. A lot of times, northern latitudes you don't you don't have the ability to harness the sun the same as you would in say a mid latitude or or a, around the equator even, right? Uh, so you can kind of see where uh, the developed regions fall. Again, so solar energy is expensive. Uh, you need to be able to develop and uh, and afford the solar panels in order to to store that energy. <clears throat> So you can see there's the triple pane windows on the uh, housing we see there in, in Germany. Uh, so there's some examples of that. Again, it brings in the heat 
And then you can see the use of the solar powers there, uh, the solar panels there, I should say, uh, to bring in specifically in, in places that receive a lot of sun. Right. So if you think of like places around the desert, if we were able to put um, solar panels in the desert, um, like the Mojave Desert here in the United States, we'd be able to generate quite a bit of uh, electric power here from solar energy. So what ways are humans impacting the environment? This is kind of getting into the pollution aspect of things a little bit. And really, there's three major ways we can look at um, humans in impacting the environment. Air pollution, water pollution, and land pollution, right? On a global scale, obviously, we're talking about things like climate change. On a regional scale, you might be talking about things like acid precipitation. And on a local scale, you're talking about like air pollution, urban air pollution, respiratory challenges. Um, you hear those things sometimes in the news that, well, we have a, we have a, a, a breathing uh, issue this weekend, right? It's going to be the, the air quality is not going to be great. So uh, try to avoid going outside and, and doing strenuous activities, things like that. Well, that becomes more common specifically in a lot of larger urban parts of the world. Um, water pollution, right? We have two different types of water pollution, point source pollution and non-point solution. Uh, source pollution. So we look at uh, wastewater for the point source is coming from specific places. It's coming from manufacturers, factories, whatever, and right into our water systems. Um, and then the non-point is things like agriculture. So it's like things like runoff. So herbicides, pesticides, running off fields, and then into rivers, streams, lakes, whatever. Then we look at land pollution, and we're talking about solid waste disposal. Um, basically, more than half of the half of the garbage that we have goes to landfills. All right. Some of it goes to incinerators. Some of it goes to recycling. But obviously, that's still a big, a big issue when we talk about pollution in general. There's your air pollution. You can see where it is actually worse around the world. So the worst global air pollution. A lot of it in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia. You can see there's a lot actually across uh, kind of northern and central Africa too. Right. Not real great, uh, great pollution or uh, air quality in those places. Here's uh, air pollution issues when you actually see it in an urban area. So air pollution is the worst in South Asia. Um, and so that's what we're looking at on the top there. Uh, that right picture there, that is uh, Lahore, Pakistan. Um, and you can see that's just during the day. That's what it looks like that day. And then you can see air pollution in Mexico City down below. Uh, those are basically similar pictures there. In fact, that building in the lower right, you can see it's the same building in both pictures. Um, and you can see that in the, the picture on the left, you can't see the background at all. But on the picture on the right, it's a clear day. There's no smog issues that day. And you can see all the way to the mountains. All right. So that is what we're talking about when we're talking about air pollution. We're not just talking about, you know, things in the sky. We're talking about smog and and poor air quality conditions. So here's, you can see where uh, air pollution is its worst specifically when we get to like the ideas of acid rain. <clears throat> and this is like rain that, again, it causes, it's, it's not going to physically hurt you, but it's going to, uh, it, it's going to be rain that, that includes pollution in some way. All right, so you can see the acid rain versus the polluted air emissions that we see in those areas. And it shouldn't be a huge surprise. A lot of them tend to come in those more developed parts of the world. Right? That's where we are polluting a lot more. So here's a little bit more with air pollution. Again, we look at the human cause of, of increased carbon dioxide. And you can see that the temperature has started to rise as we, we have produced more and more carbon dioxide globally. And air pollution obviously increases um, when we look at the... Uh, gross national income for a country as well. The more money a, or the more wealthy a country is, the more developed they are, we tend to see more pollution going along with it. Here's our water pollution here. So we look at agriculture as the largest single consumer uh, of water. And that's, uh, again, agriculture can be fairly destructive to, uh, to the environment as well, whether it's water, whether it's land. But again, a lot of water and pollution coming from agriculture here. You can see the developed world has a much higher per capita water withdrawal than the developing world. We use a lot of water and we, North America specifically, we talk about Canada and the United States as being leading agricultural countries. We use a lot of water to do it. Right? Water pollution can also take this form here where we just talk about the, the loss of, of water due to irrigation. <clears throat> this right here is a, a picture of the Aral Sea at different times. You can see from 1990 all the way to 2015. You can see the Aral Sea is essentially gone. All right, this is a sea that's uh, it's in Central Asia, and you can see that uh, they have used so much of the the water here for uh, irrigation and for crops that basically the 
the sea is now gone today, right? There's very, very little bit of the sea remaining. Let me get talk about solid waste. Again, that's the idea of landfills and, and other aspects. When it comes to that, we talk about uh, industrial sites that release toxic chemicals or hazardous waste. And so you can see some of those across the United States, a lot in the Western portion of the US, but quite a bit in kind of the central portion here too, right? A lot of those are mines, specifically the ones out west are, are mines. And so how do, we, uh, how do we change that? How does recycling, if we're able to recycle, how does that impact our environment? And we know recycling, pretty basic. It's the separation, collection, processing, marketing, and reuse of the unwanted material that we have. And so things like paper, plastic, glass, aluminum, those are kind of the four most commonly, common things that we can recycle into new products. And so we have all kinds of different types of recycling, whether it's curbside, like most of us do, or you can drop certain things off at processors. Um, in some cases, you can buy the materials back, um, or they do buy them back, I should say. And in some cases, you deposit them in a box and, and things like that. But regardless, um, we look at all of these different versions of recycling uh, do impact the environment in ways, all right? Um, and it comes down to remanufacturing, and that's the building of products of, to spec, uh, specifications of the original manufactured product using a common, combination of reused, repaired, or new parts. And so, again, the idea here, the principal inputs in when we look at manufacturing and remanufacturing are paper, plastic, glass, and aluminum, right? You guys have all probably seen those benches at parks that they're like these gi giant plastic benches and a lot of times it maybe even says on the bench or near it that this bench was uh, is all recycled material right they're basically taking like pop bottles like the plastic pop bottles and recycling them into benches things that can be used in other other ways too so when we look at the rest of the world and recycling and remanufacturing europe uh really leads the way here they've been very progressive in their recycling you can see just how much is recycled from there um and then you can see the united states as kind of an example too we're not we're not slouches necessarily but we're not at the level of a lot of the german countries or excuse me the german country but a lot of the uh, european countries as well we also look at recycling and remanufacturing again uh, and, and how much it's increased since 1960 in the United States. You can see quite a bit, right? Um, and I'll be honest with you, when we put our garbage out, a lot of times the recycling is more full than the, than the garbage. So that's a good thing. That's a good sign that we are recycling more and more. Here's your look at it, kind of recycling and remanufacturing. The left side shows us a share of different sources of waste, and then the right side shows us the share remaining after some of the waste has been recycled. So you can see it does it does definitely um, cut back on the amount of waste that we are are using. Right? We do supply or we do create a lot of waste as humans for sure. Here's a little bit more talking about the recycling and remanufacturing. Um, you, on the left there, you can see the recycled glass, which is going to be remanufactured re into new glass products. And on the right there, you can see the recycling and compost. A lot of times festivals will have places where you can recycle and, and put your compost things in there, like music festivals and things. Uh, so you have a place to put those cans, bottles, paper, or whatever, plastics. And that's it, ladies and gentlemen. So hopefully you enjoyed that, guys. You got everything you needed for Chapter 11, Key Issue 2 and 3. We will see you again soon.